Section 30 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31. Henry II. 1547 to 1559. Part four. Philip, with anxious modesty, sent information of his victory to his father, Charles, who had been in retirement since February 21, 1556, at the monastery of Yust. Quote, As I did not happen to be there myself, he said at the end of his letter, about which I am heavy at heart as to what your majesty will possibly think, I can only tell you from hearsay what took place. End quote. We have not the reply of Charles V to his son, but his close confidant, Quejada, wrote, quote, The emperor felt at this news one of the greatest thrills of satisfaction he has ever had. But to tell you the truth, I perceive by his manner that he cannot reconcile himself to the thought that his son was not there, and with good reason. End quote. After Saint-Quentin had surrendered, the Duke of Savoy wanted to march forward and strike affrighted France to the very heart, and the aged emperor was of his mind. Quote, "'Is the king my son at Paris?' he said, when he heard of his victory. Philip had thought differently about it instead of hurling his army on Paris. He had moved it back to Saint-Quentin, and kept it for the reduction of places in the neighborhood. Quote, the Spaniards, says Rabutin, might have accomplished our total extermination and taken from us all hope of setting ourselves up again. But the supreme ruler, the god of victories, pulled them up quite short. End quote. An unlooked for personage, Queen Catherine de Medici, then for the first time entered actively upon the scene. We borrow the very words of the Venetian ambassadors who lived within her sphere. The first, Lorenzo Contarini, wrote in 1552, quote, The queen is younger than the king, but only thirteen days. She is not pretty, but she is possessed of extraordinary wisdom and prudence. No doubt of her being fit to govern. Nevertheless, she is not consulted or considered so much as she well might be. End quote. Five years later, in 1557, after the battle and capture of Saint Quentin, France was in a fit of stupor. Paris believed the enemy to be already beneath her walls. Many of the Burgesses were packing up and flying, some to Orléans, some to Bourges, some still farther. The king had gone to Compiègne, quote, to get together, says Brantome, a fresh army, end quote. Queen Catherine was alone at Paris. Of her own motion, quote, she went to the Parliament, according to the Memoire de la Châtre, it was to the Hôtel de Ville that she went and made her address, in full state, accompanied by the cardinals, princes, and princesses, and there, in the most impressive language, she set forth the urgent state of affairs at the moment. She pointed out that in spite of the enormous expenses into which the most Christian king had found himself drawn in his late wars, he had shown the greatest care not to burden the towns. In the continuous and extreme pressure of requirements Her Majesty did not think that any further charge could be made on the people of the country places, who in ordinary times always bear the greatest burden. With so much sentiment and eloquence that she touched the heart of everybody, the Queen then explained to the Parliament that the King had need of three hundred thousand livres, twenty-five thousand to be paid every two months, and she added that she would retire from the place of session so as not to interfere with liberty of discussion and she accordingly retired to an adjoining room a resolution to comply with the wishes of her majesty was voted and the queen having resumed her place received a promise to that effect a hundred notables of the city offered to give at once three thousand francs apiece the queen thanked them in the sweetest form of words and thus terminated this session of parliament with so much applause for her majesty and such lively marks of satisfaction at her behaviour that no idea can be given of them Throughout the whole city nothing was spoken of but the Queen's prudence and the happy manner in which she proceeded in this enterprise. End quote. Such is the account, not of a French courtier, but of the Venetian ambassador, Giacomo Lorenzo, writing confidentially to his government. From that day the position of Catherine de' Medici was changed in France, amongst the people as well as at court. Quote, the king went more often to see her. He added to his habits that of holding court at her apartments for about an hour every day after supper in the midst of the lords and ladies. End quote. 
It is not to be discovered anywhere in the contemporary memoir whether Catherine had anything to do with the resolution taken by Henry the Second on returning from Compiègne. But she thenceforth assumed her place, and gave a foretaste of the part she was to play in the government of France. Unhappily for the honour of Catherine and for the welfare of France, that part soon ceased to be judicious, dignified, and salutary, as it had been on that day of its first exhibition. On entering Paris again, the king at once sent orders to the Duke of Guise to return in haste from Italy with all the troops he could bring. Every eye and every hope were fixed upon the able and heroic defender of Metz, who had forced Charles V to retreat before him. A general appeal was at the same time addressed to, quote, all soldiers, gentlemen, and others, who had borne or were capable of bearing arms, to muster at Léon, under the Duke of Nevers, in order to be employed for the service of the king and for the tuition, protection, of their country, their families, and their property, end quote. Guise arrived on the 20th of October, 1557, at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, where the court happened to be just then. Every mark of favour was lavished upon him. All the resources of the state were put at his disposal. There was even some talk of appointing him viceroy. But Henry II confined himself to proclaiming him, on the very day of his arrival, lieutenant-general of the armies throughout the whole extent of the monarchy, both within and without the realm. His brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine, who was as ambitious and almost as able as he, had the chief direction in civil, financial, and diplomatic affairs. Never since the great mayors of the palace, under the Merovingian kings, had similar power been in the hands of a subject. Like a man born to command, Guise saw that in so complicated a situation a brilliant stroke must be accompanied, and a great peril be met by a great success." Quote, he racked his brains for all sorts of devices for enabling him to do some remarkable deed, which might humble the pride of that haughty Spanish nation, and revive the courage of his own men. And he took it that those things which the enemy considered as the most secure would be the least carefully guarded. Some years previously it had been suggested to the constable that an attempt might be made upon Calais, negligently guarded as it was, and the place itself not being in good order. The Duke of Guise put the idea of this enterprise forward once more, and begged the king's permission to attempt it, without saying a word about it to anybody else, which the king considered to be a very good notion. Guise took the command of the army, and made a feint of directing its movements towards an expedition in the east of the kingdom. But suddenly turning westwards, he found himself on the night of January the 1st, 1558, beneath the walls of Calais, quote, whither, with right good will, all the princes, lords, and soldiers had marched. End quote. On the 3rd of January, he took the two forts of Nieulet and Risbank, which covered the approaches to the place. On the 4th, he prepared for, and on the 6th, he delivered the assault upon the citadel itself, which was carried. He left there his brother, the Duke of Omal, with a sufficient force for defence. The portion of the English garrison which had escaped at the assault fell back within the town. The governor, Lord Wentworth, quote, like a man in desperation who saw he was all but lost, end quote, made vain attempts to recover this important post under cover of night and of the high sea, which rendered impossible the prompt arrival of any aid for the French. But, quote, they held their own inside the castle, end quote. The English requested the Duke of Omal, quote, to parley so as to come to some honourable and reasonable terms, end quote, and Guise assented. On the 8th of January, whilst he was conferring in his tent with the representatives of the governor, Coligny's brother, Dandelot, entered the town at the solicitation of the English themselves, who were afraid of being all put to the sword. The capitulation was signed. The inhabitants, with their wives and children, had their lives spared, and received permission to leave Calais freely and without any insult, and withdraw to England or Flanders. Lord Wentworth and fifty other persons, to be chosen by the Duke of Guise, remained prisoners of war. With this exception, all the soldiers were to return to England, but with empty hands. The place was left with all the cannons, arms, munitions, utensils, engines of war, flags and standards, which happened to be in it. The furniture, the gold and silver, coined or other, the merchandise, and the horses passed over to the disposal of the Duke of Guise. Lastly, the vanquished, when they quitted the town, were to leave it intact, having no power to pull down houses, unpave streets, throw up earth, displace a single stone, pull out a single nail. The conqueror's precautions were as deliberate as his audacity had been sudden. 
On the ninth of January, 1558, after a week's siege, Calais, which had been in the hands of the English for two hundred and ten years, once more became a French town, in spite of the inscription which was engraved on one of its gates, and which may be turned into the following distich, quote, A siege of Calais may seem good, when lead and iron swim like wood. End quote. The joy was so much the greater in that it was accompanied by great surprise. Save a few members of the king's council, nobody expected this conquest. Quote, I certainly thought that you must be occupied in preparing for some great exploit, and that you wished to wait until you could apprise me of the execution rather than the design, wrote Marshal de Brissac to the Duke of Guise on the 22nd of January from Italy. Foreigners were not less surprised than the French themselves. They had supposed that France would remain for a long while under the effects of the reverse experienced at Saint-Quentin. The loss of Calais, said Pope Paul IV, will be the only dowry that the Queen of England will obtain from her marriage with Philip. For France, such a conquest is preferable to that of half the kingdom of England. End quote. When Mary Tudor, already seriously ill, heard the news, she exclaimed from her deathbed on the 20th of January, quote, If my heart is opened, there will be found graven upon it the word Calais. End quote. And when the Grand Prior of France, on repairing to the court of his sister Mary of Lorraine in Scotland, went to visit Queen Elizabeth, who had succeeded Mary Tudor, she, after she had made him dance several times with her, said to him, quote, my dear prior, I like you very much, but not your brother, who robbed me of my town of Calais. End, quote. End of section thirty.